I bring you greetings from across the Atlantic, where, as you may know, in June 2015, the United States Supreme Court affirmed the right of same-sex couples to marry with all of the rights and privileges attendant thereto. It was a big moment. I live in the great state of Massachusetts, where 13 years ago in 2003, our state's highest court issued a decision pursuant to which Massachusetts became the first state in the nation to allow same-sex couples to marry. Judge Margaret H. Marshall, who wrote the decision for the court, hailed from Newcastle, South Africa, where she had been a student leader in the anti-apartheid movement, so she understood something about oppression and discrimination. Justice Marshall wrote, and I'm going to read these words, Civil marriage is at once a deeply personal celebration and a highly public celebration of the ideals of mutuality, companionship, intimacy, fidelity, and family. Because it fulfills yearnings for connectivity, safe haven that express our common humanity, civil marriage is an esteemed institution, and the decision whether and whom to marry is among life's momentous acts of self-definition. Because Justice Marshall's powerful words spoke not just to the yearnings of same-sex couples, but also to the common humanity of all human beings. That passage has become now a customary reading in weddings for same-sex couples and heterosexual couples, not just in Massachusetts, but across the country, and indeed, across the world. So now that we have crossed that great divide, now that same-sex couples can actually marry across the United States, it's become time to ask, what took so long for our friends and our families to recognize our common humanity? The riots at the Stonewall Inn in New York City's Greenwich Village, roundly understood to be the seminal event in the, in the LGBT community's search for full equality, began on June 28, 1969. Why did it take the United States Supreme Court 46 years almost to the day before it recognized our common humanity? And why here in Belfast and in the six counties of Northern Ireland, despite focused effort for years by the LGBT community and its many allies and friends, is same-sex marriage still a goal rather than a given? The first challenge is fear. The straight community's fear of the difference of the LGBT community and the LGBT community's fears about the dangers and consequences of coming out of being seen for our true, authentic selves. In many respects, despite our ability to tweet across thousands of miles, our flat world, our experience of other continents without even leaving home, humans are still quintessentially tribal. We define by connected and different, in-group and out-group, same and other. And we tend to be quite leery of anyone that we think is different, who presents differently, who worships differently, who loves differently. We make up myths about those people, about their ability to maintain long-term relationships, to conform to our norms, to follow our laws, to have a true relationship with our God. And then we repeat those myths so many times that they take on the aura of truth. On the LGBT side, people have a justifiable fear of making themselves known, of coming out. The good news is LGBT people are generally no longer burned at the stake, but we have a long history of being assaulted, of being fired from our jobs, and of being rejected by our families and friends, and sometimes worse. Who can forget the 49 people killed at Pulse, the Orlando nightclub, earlier this year? Or Matthew Shepard, the American college student who was beaten, tortured, and murdered simply because he was gay? are the savage deaths of people around the world, all of whom were targeted simply because they were members of the LGBT community. So the real issue is fear. So how do we bridge the chasm of fear that keeps the LGBT community from achieving full equality? I want to recognize up front that our countries have different histories, different cultures, different experiences. I can share with you the lessons we learned, the strategies we employed on the route to full equality, 
but I leave it to you to determine which of those strategies and which of those lessons is useful in the struggle here. First, we need to accept one universal truth. Getting angry at people who are afraid does not move anything forward. No matter how justified the anger, no matter how righteous, no matter how frustrated we are, anger has never banished anybody's fear. Second, the long-term success of equality movements depends on our ability to create allies, not adversaries. Love really does trump fear, and not just in this political <laughs> season. Third, the need to educate parts of the straight community and to assuage its fears can be a monumental and daunting task, particularly when we're busy struggling with our own fears. In addition to pursuing every available political, legal, and judicial avenue, however, that is what must happen. We must make ourselves known, not just to ourselves, but publicly. Ironically, our invisibility, the very thing that we have set out to erase, has provided an enormous boost to the LGBT community, because unlike, say, women or people of color, many LGBT people can hide in plain sight. The riots at the Stonewall Inn back in 1969 were driven by the people who were then most marginalized in our community, drag queens, stone butch lesbians, homeless youth, trans people, because they were really at the end of their rope. They could not hide and they had nothing left to lose. They were members of our community who were unwilling or unable to pass. But eventually, long-term success requires that the rest of us, those with lots to lose, jobs and assets, families and friends, we have to find our courage, and we must find our voice, and we must serve as a bridge to the larger community. And when we finally come out, we are indeed everywhere. In corporations from the smallest to the Fortune 100, in law firms and bar associations, in appointed office and elected office, in religious institutions and healthcare institutions, on TV and radio, in the entertainment in industry, even on sp pro sports teams. We're really everywhere. And when we come out, we already have substantial assets that we can use to help build our community. We have funds, we have money. We can support organizing efforts and lobbying efforts and legal efforts. And we can support those elected officials who are willing to stand with us and help us to achieve full equality. We are already in place in leadership positions, and we have family and friends and allies who can augment our ability to move powerful institutions in the direction we need them to go. In the United States this year, we had a great example of the power of making our presence known. When in North Carolina, the legislature decided to pass anti-LGBT legislation, a hate-filled bill aimed at all facets of our community and signed in the dead of night. The public response has been extraordinary. PayPal and Deutsche Bank have since announced their plans to abandon expansion in North Carolina. Cirque du Soleil and Pearl Jam and Bruce Springsteen and Ringo Starr have all uh, canceled their appearances. NASCAR, the Stock Car Racing Association, <laughs> has spoken out against the bill and is working for its repeal. The National Basketball Association moved its 2017 All-Star Game out of North Carolina, and college athletic associations followed suit. And hundreds of governors and mayors across the United States prohibited municipal and state workers from traveling to North Carolina. You should all be aware that the, that the Foreign Office of the United Kingdom has issued a warning to its LGBT citizens about traveling to North Carolina. <laughs> so when you look at that, I can feel quite confident in saying none of that would have happened if, in fact, the LGBT community had not come out, not just publicly, but politically as well. We would never have generated the kinds of alliances that really have led to these actions. We had to take the risk of coming out, and the risk additionally of becoming out as politically active. Coming out in a sense in the words of Frederick Douglass, the 19th century abolitionist who said, he said, power seeds nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Because we knew that, because we accepted that, we had this extraordinary response to North Carolina. 
Openness generates public activism, and public activism generates uh, uh, political activity. In Massachusetts, we now have an openly lesbian attorney general who on her return from the Democratic National Convention this summer told me that more than 800 of the delegates who were present at that convention were members of the LGBT community. And for those of you who listened to any of the speeches from that convention, you know that support for the full equality of our community, for our right to love whomever we choose, was a constant theme. Coming out, even to oneself, can be scary and lonely. I well remember my own coming out process in 1978. I was at that time employed by the federal government, and many of my colleagues were wonderful human beings, bright, compassionate, hardworking people with a full measure of integrity, people I would have been happy to call my friends. But the rules of the federal government governed all of us, and at that time, those rules required that if any federal employee were discovered to be homosexual, that employee needed to be discharged immediately. Well, I needed to keep my job, so I kept my distance and I maintained my secret. It would take me another 15 years until early 1993 to actually come out publicly. Bill Clinton was in the White House. That would be the first Clinton administration. <laughs> <laughs> and I had just left my law firm and had gone over to run a business, and I discovered I could not lead people and run a business from the closet. Coming out no longer has to be scary, it no longer has to be an isolated act. We can build on the international momentum that we've all created. We can rely on each other, on friends and allies, and we can create critical mass. We can take lots of actions that make coming out easier. Here are some examples. We can promote National Coming Out Day, celebrated in many countries across the globe on October 11th. Create Coming Out Tuesdays, or Thursdays if you'd like. For people who have already come out to friends and family, consider coming out to political leaders and religious leaders. Show them pictures of your partners, your kids, your pets, your garden. Help them understand how similar we are. Engage all of your supporters and family members and friends. Sing together. Do not allow people governed by fear to appropriate love of country or love of God. Reach out to those members of the clergy who are helpful and inclined to be supportive. Meet with the other LGBT people in your workplace or in your profession. Discuss the matter. And when you are ready to take the risk, take a deep breath and all come out together. <laughs> Ally with friends and allies. Create alliances that can work together. Become politically active. Insist on the LGBT's community's right to full and inclusive equality. Support candidates who share your views. Finally, stay the course. You are very close. You have already achieved a majority in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Now is the moment to work with, to focus on, and to support the DUP and its constituents to help them understand that we're really not so different, to allow them to ease their fears so that they remove their petition of concern. The four years between the moment when same-sex marriages became legal in Massachusetts and the legalization of marriage in California and Connecticut felt like a very long drought, but we simply kept putting one foot in front of the other. And when the dam finally broke, progress was swift. In my view, one of the very best reasons to be alive is because we have the opportunity to help build the world we want. Not just for ourselves, not just for our community, but for all the communities that are important to us. By claiming our identity, by coming out as a community, by engaging in political activism, we open our lives to our friends and our families and our colleagues. And in doing that, we cause a sea change to occur across our communities, indeed, across our world. Coming out not only makes our lives transparent and, and allows us to integrate, but it allows us also for the first time to begin to publicly pursue the world we want, the values that hold dear to each of us. So imagine with me, if you will, a world in which kids coming of age can pursue their sexual orientation and gender identity questions without fear or shame, in which the LGBT community has full equality, takes its place at the table, and is no longer subject to discrimination, 
in which the straight community and the LGBT community both give up their fear of each other, in which equality, full equality for trans people is a given. Imagine with me a world in which we can all bring our full and inclusive selves to the table with all of our strengths and weaknesses and foibles and differences and similarities. We can all work to trying to create a better world. In the words of Samuel Beckett, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. And in the words of our feminist icon, Susan B. Anthony, failure is impossible. Thanks very much.